So it's my <coughs> great pleasure to introduce our first um, speaker of the day, which is Margarita Klee from ETH Zurich. She is a professor there heading the Vision for Robotics lab. And um, Margarita started her career in Dublin and Cambridge, where she did her master in, in information and communication engineering. Then after her degree in 2005, she moved to London and joined um, Andrew Davison's group at Imperial College where she did her PhD and graduated in 2009. Then she moved to ETH Zurich. Then a few years later, got appointed as an assistant professor at Edinburgh University in 2013, and two years later became a fellow. And also in 2015, she got reappointed to ETH Zurich, where she is today heading her own lab. And it's our great pleasure that she is here. She is very famous for her work on real-time vision, working with UAVs and other flying vehicles, and looking into questions like how can we do the perception on board as fast as possible, integrating it in decision processes. Um, she also got selected as one of the top, top 25 women in robotics in 2016. And last year, she was one of the speakers of the TEDx conference. So I can say, from TEDx to Bonn, which is <laughs> a great honor for us. So Margarita, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. So good morning from my side. Thanks, Cyril, for this great introduction. Um, hopefully this is okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about teaching robots to see. So some of our challenges and current developments in robotic vision. So a lot of the inspiration in, in my work comes from nature, such as this example here where um, the eagle is able to see through water and plan its path such that it's able to grasp the salmon, I think it is, while they're both in motion. So imagine how stunning this is. And for anyone who has worked with vision uh, should know that um, water is terrible because you can see through it, but it also reflects light, so it's terrible. But then also examples like this one, where um, this flock of starlings, they're able to move with each other in seemingly perfect coordination. They create these beautiful formations with, without actually crashing into each other. So the question is, um, what kind of skill and situational awareness do we need to build in our robots, our drones, for example, to be able to do um, tasks like this and cohabit the space that we are um, uh, interacting in? So I've taken this uh, big question, mouthful, and broken it down into three distinct challenges that um, I think we should be addressing. So firstly, we need to address robust ego motion estimation and scene estimation. Then once we have that, we want to build some level of, um, let's say, a, a level higher of intelligence to start um, being aware of the scene such that our robots can interact with the scene and do path planning. And finally, when we have many agents that are intelligent enough to deal with these two challenges, then we want them to do something together, um, to collaborate together in a multi-agent situation. Which brings me to the vision of what we would like to do at the Vision for Robotics Lab. We would like to have a team of robots, let's say small aircraft like these ones, that they are equipped with uh, sensors, let's say cameras, and first of all, we want them to be able to navigate in, in space autonomously as individuals without crashing into the world. And then once we have a collection of intelligent individuals, then we want to have them collaborating um, to perform a common task together. For example, to build a map of their workspace. Now, in order to realize this vision, we actually have to address these three challenges which is, uh, they also correspond to the three main research directions in my lab. I'm going to go through them, explain to you what we are trying to do in each challenge and give you a taste of some of the approaches that we are developing to address them. So firstly, let's talk about robust eagle motion and scene estimation. What does that mean? Well, Ego motion. How can I uh, estimate um, the motion of a moving vehicle, a robot, while it is moving? You might say, I know how to do that. I can just take my phone, 
um, switch my GPS localization on and use Google Maps or my favorite uh, uh, app to tell me how I'm going to um, arrive at my destination and it's going to follow me there as well and tell me where I am while I'm moving. I think this is a great example of ego motion estimation and it requires two things. First of all, it needs a good GPS uh, reception and it needs a good map of the environment, right? You might see already where I'm going with this. So can we have, can we rely on these two things? Well, first of all, the localization system. We cannot really rely on it in here or on Mars or in narrow streets. So it's not always available or reliable. How about the map? Can we rely on the map? How does Google do it? Well, they um, actually have vehicles that go and refresh the map every now and again, right? Because buildings get demolished, new ones get erected. So to be honest, we can never really truly rely on that map. Also indoors, things change. The chair moves from one place to another. So can we rely on the map that I rec we recorded in the previous run? So in order to deal with these problems, um, we have been working, we as a community, have been working on um, trying to mount sensors on the moving vehicle, on the robot, such as a camera, and try and do this from scratch every time. So estimate the motion of the robot and also the scene of um, the workspace, basically, of the robot. And right now I'm going to talk about the camera. Oh, my slide is a little bit cut there. Camera. Okay. So. Um, the way that we do it in um, robotic vision is that we pick natural scene features uh, to serve as landmarks. So these square patches that you see in this very old video of mine. And uh, we judge how these um, square patches move from one frame to the next. And then we start reasoning about how the camera has been moving in order to capture them. And this technique we call SLAM. Uh, which stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. And I promise that this is, yes, this is the only acronym I'm going to introduce. But it's important. Um, has anyone heard of SLAM before? Hans? Yay, good. So this is going to be great. Um, so it's essentially this um, same technique that we used to um, in this work here, uh, with where we were doing visual inertial slam on board a small aircraft like that one, like that one is a big hug of an aircraft, and that has a downward looking camera and it's tracking features in image space, judging how these features move from one frame to the next of the video. Then we are making a re we reason about how the camera and hence the helicopter is moving uh, from one pose to the next. And this was the first time that we were able to show that we can automate the flight of a small aircraft like this using a single camera and one inertial sensor. Now we have to say that in order to capture a, a nice pretty video like this we had to go um, on site two days in advance to make sure that our cameras are working, our network is working, so a lot of things to tune before we can prove this is autonomous flight. So you can actually say argue that's not very autonomous, right? So. Um, what I'm trying to say is that we've been having a lot of issues and we still have some issues. So let's see some of them. So here is a shopping street in Zurich. My student is walking with a sensor head um, on her hand. Uh, it's tracking visual inertial um, uh, readings basically. So you can see her path in red, the current features in orange and the ones that um, stay in the map in yellow. The street is straight. She's walking on one side and coming back on the other side. And at some point we are uh, showing essentially that um, we are deviating from reality and actually these two locations should have been the same location. So this is what we call drift in SLAM. So we shouldn't be um, having problems like this if we want our maps and our ego motion estimation to be correct. So how do we deal with this? Well, we know that even if you have the best SLAM system in the world, you're going to be accumulating errors. Sorry about that. You're going to be accumulating errors while, you, while your system is running, unless you have some global reference um, measurements, right? So in order to deal with problems like this, we run something called place recognition. 
So um, what we do in place recognition, we try and recognize when the robot is coming back to a known location. And we do this by building a vocabulary of visual words and actually um, develop systems a little bit like Google Images, where we are querying almost every single image uh, that the robot is looking at and trying to figure out whether the this image we have seen at some time in the past of the robot's trajectory. And in cases like this, we want to bring the two locations together, which actually corresponds to the um, uh, t research topic of uh, a great PhD student of Cyril that I came to examine here in, in September. That was my first trip in Bonn. Um, right, so some problems of place recognition. Well, when you're trying to recognize a place using a camera, you have the problem that different places might, might look the same the same places might look different between runs, and that's even more the case when you're considering season and illumination changes. And on top of that, when you're actually visiting a scene with a, um, with a small aircraft, you have different viewpoints. So is actually this place the same as this place, the same as this place? Well, it's a philosophical question, but let's say yes, they correspond to the same castle. So um, these are a lot of challenges that in the community, um, people are trying, or researchers are trying to deal with in isolation mostly because they're um, very difficult to address all of them at the same time. And here is a manifestation of one of our works where we're going back to the same street in this blue trajectory now, six months later, and we're trying to see how well our system works. So here we are um, comparing both visual appearance and some local geometric information from the SLAM map that we're capturing. So you can see that in some cases where green uh, loop closures should have occurred, they haven't occurred. And in other places, we, we are able to recognize uh, loop closures like this. And actually, when my student was labeling this data set, she figured out it's a rather difficult data set because the stores are changing their displays, some stores change their logos, but it's amazing to humans how easy it is to suppress all these transient changes. So the question is, how can we make our systems be um, robust to changes like this? Now, in order to deal with uh, seasonal and illumination changes, uh, we mostly rely on deep learning. So, And here are some examples to show you um, uh, uh, pairs of query images and return images that uh, correspond to the same location according to this system that was trained with years of webcam data that were capturing uh, images in February and in June of the same place. So webcam uh, information that captured the same place in February and in June and making this correlation of what are these changes that I should uh, suppress when I'm deciding whether this is a location I have seen before and what are these um, uh, unique features in that image that will make me distinguish this place from another place, right? Uh, so these are all ongoing uh, research areas and ongoing questions. But if you remember, we're back in this challenge on having a robust slum. And one final topic I'd like to touch upon here is the fact that, yes, cameras are useful. The, the visible light cameras that we all know are very useful. Um, but we're also having problems with them. For example, when it's dark or when we're moving very fast, we have motion blur. So in cases like this, we also work with different kinds of sensors like LiDAR or even event cameras, as you see here, where event cameras are capturing these um, changes in illumination. Uh, changes in intensity, basically. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of the corner tracks that um, uh, in one of our works, uh, my student has managed to isolate out of this uh, very rich uh, event stream. So, right. So we, we embarked on this uh, quest to have robust ego motion and scene estimation, which actually, I told you, we call it SLAM. So in order to do SLAM, we've... Um, talked a little bit about uh, some SLAM techniques, sensor fusion, event cameras, place recognition, deep learning, there's so many things going on. Um, and this is forming the backbone of the awareness of space for a robot. So um, a robot cannot really move unless it kind of knows where it is and what this environment looks like. Now, in order to come up with a pose and a map of its surroundings, now the key thing here is that this map is sparse. So, so far, I've been talking about uh, sparse point cloud. 
a sparse 3D point cloud, if you'd like. Which brings me to the second challenge of what we are trying to do, to build in some scene awareness such that our robots are able to reach out and grasp an object uh, without crashing into it and also perform some path planning. Such as in this example here where the drone takes off, knows nothing about the scene and using one camera it is able to um, progressively um, understand the depth of the scene. So in red you can see uh, the ground truth taken with a laser scanner and then the rest are um, depth completion uh, readings that our system has learned how to complete given some very initial seeds. And we're also coming up with a confidence level so we're also filtering out any depth estimates that we think or the robot thinks uh, they are not um, uh, accurate enough to come up with nice reconstructions like this. So how useful would it be if we had um, a robot that is intelligent enough or a, a drone that is intelligent enough to override the pilot's commands in cases where he or she is driving it into a wall. Something like semi-autonomous driving but for drones. And it's actually systems like this that then we plug in with uh, a bigger path planning technique to tell us um, basically to actually complete the loop of autonomous navigation. So in this case, again, the, the drone takes off, knows nothing about the scene, but as soon as it takes off and it initializes a map, we're giving it a goal position. The goal position is somewhere outside the slide, somewhere here. And then that acts like a magnet. So right now my robot is somewhere here and as it's trying to reach that goal, which is somewhere there, um, it's trying to follow the fastest route, but it's experiencing new parts of the scene. So it's carving out uh, new obstacles and then replans its path on the way. Right, which brings me to the third challenge. Let's imagine that you have robots that are intelligent enough to do challenge one and two. How can we have multiple intelligent agents collaborating with each other? Now, in order to address this, I'm going to go a little bit into more detail about SLAM. But uh, bear with me, I think this can be interesting also for people who know SLAM. So, um, oh dear. <laughs> this was supposed to be the legend, but I'm going to explain exactly what it was supposed to be doing. So, imagine that you have an empty room. That empty room has three features. This X1, X2, blah, 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 X0 that you see here. And then we have a robot that is able to uh, view these features somehow. Let's say that we have a camera and this camera is able to view these features. So this is the robot here. And just to introduce some notation, this is the robot at time t. And this is how uh, basically that features project in, a, in an image, uh, in the 2D patch that I'm going to call Z. So here is it. It is in a graphical structure. So we have some 3D landmarks in the scene, right? And we have some camera poses, robot poses. They are connected by control inputs. Let's say um, if it's a ground robot, you can think of them as move left one meter, move right by whatever centimeters. And then these camera poses are related to the landmarks via some 2D observations. These uh, um, let's say, measurements of 2D patches that I'm observing these landmarks from. So this is really uh, the whole graph um, encodes all of the constraints that we are building in throughout SLAM as the robot, as the camera is experiencing the world. So in full graph optimization, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to estimate this posterior of where has the robot been? What does the world look like given all of the observations, so these are the ones we know, and given all of the control inputs? So basically the way to do this we is that we are introducing direct constraints. We are eliminating or marginalizing out this, um, this intermediate variable that we know about such that we are able to uh, create direct constraints between the variables that we're trying to figure their value of. So you can consider this as a network of springs, right? Every feature and every pose wants to pull and push its own way. And the best solution to SLAM is to let this thing relax and come up with a globally consistent solution, uh, which is our full graph optimization or bundle adjustment, uh, as we call it. 
Now, you might see that uh, the more uh, of the world I explore, the more of these constraints I start uh, introducing and more links start coming in the way. So how am, am I going to stay uh, within the real-time limits? So one of the approximations that is now considered um, a good approximation to use is just to ignore some of the intermediate poses. I know it sounds um, naive, but actually works very well. As long as you figure out which frames you are really retaining, some keyframes. That's why we call it the keyframe approximation. So instead of optimizing over all of the poses, you optimize over all of the keyframes, of the key poses that you decide to uh, retain in the system. And this scales, of course, better with time. Now, why is this relevant to all of this? Uh, consider that you have a drone, right, that um, is running a visual slam with this local bundle adjustment. And just some notation here to show you a little bit under the hood what's happening under the carpet. There's some math, not just pretty videos. So um, imagine we have a world reference frame. This is uh, world features. That's a feature J, it's a three-dimensional vector. And then I'm encoding my keyframe uh, key pose as a transformation from the world to that camera frame. So it's a rotation uh, a matrix and a translation vector, essentially from the world frame. So what I'm trying to do in this optimization, in these springs that I was mentioning before, is that I'm trying to figure out where did this feature, where did I predict this feature to project to in my image at that camera? So this is the projection function, telling me how a world feature projects in a particular pixel location. And I'm subtracting this from where I actually saw it in the image. So using this error, I'm actually formulating a uh, and uh, a cost function here where I'm summing up over all of these errors. Don't worry too much about all of this. But essentially, I am trying to minimize the sum of all of these errors for all of these features um, by moving all of the features in 3D space and all of the camera poses, so all of the robot poses. Um, so imagine that you have one agent that is able to do that, to run this optimization, and then you have multiple ones that do the same thing independently. Right, so this is how we start now talking about collaborative SLAM. So, but for the moment, still my agents, my drones are independent, work independently of each other. So, what is it that we do? Well, we introduce a central server, and we say, I know that um, basically the onboard computational power of this machine is not uh, that advanced. So at some point, this one is going to need to start forgetting about past experiences. So before you forget about what you've seen in the world, just um, push it down to a central server. Send it down. And that central server is collecting information from everyone. And it's acting like a bookkeeping entity. So it's keeping copies of all of these maps that you see here. And also, it can do some, uh, let's say, beautification tasks, like, for example, discovering place recognition instances between uh, two maps to merge them. And once it's merging them, it also needs to optimize for any um, errors to propagate the, that uh, correction of drift. And then it's also informing of any changes to the participating agents in that, um, in that equation, if you want. So, uh, some more notation, but we're nearly there. So what happens when we're having a, a place recognition instance? So we just combined two maps. Well, in this case, the first thing that we do is that we know we're introducing a new link here. So what would that link uh, look like? Well, we're introducing another error, um, basically to make sure that there's no residual error if you apply all of the transformations here. I'm not going to go into details, but I think it's important to at least get the big picture here. Yeah. So um, basically, this is uh, the error I'm minimizing here by changing um, these links between uh, poses that I'm connecting for the first time. And then using this technique, we're first of all um, propagating all the error in the poses, just so that we bring our problem to a better starting position before we now run exactly the same optimization as we did before. So now we are really changing the poses of all of the um, 
past robot poses and all of the features in the map using exactly the same uh, cost function that I had before to do global optimization. And here is the, the video that captures all of this in action. So you can see three drones and one central server with actually a, a standard laptop. And you can see the view from the, two, uh, from the three drones. UAV stands for unmanned aerial vehicle. And uh, these are the server maps that at some point the server decides that these two uh, drones are looking at the same scene. So let's combine them, optimize those maps, and propagate information back to the drones that have participated in, um, uh, in, in this combination. So of course, we, um, we created these uh, trajectories such that they combine, such that we are able to show this, uh, this collaboration. But in this way, we are able to show how three drones can collaboratively build a map of their environment by sharing information through the server. So, and then once the map starts combining, then the drones start using common image features to localize themselves um, in. So one key uh, finding of this work is that collaboration is useful and it's bringing more accuracy not only after the, the whole mission. So not only after all of the UAVs have captured their uh, environment and they are sitting down and then I'm optimizing the whole uh, map, but also during the mission because every agent can have access to data from other agents basically at the same time. So in this way, during the mission, the drones uh, can have a more accurate uh, estimate of where they are in space and what their workspace looks like. Right, so collaboration. Um, what's next? You might have guessed already that the biggest bottleneck of this problem is that this is a centralized architecture and all information needs to pass through the server. So this is our limiting factor, of course. So we are working towards more distributed collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer communication because also um, the fact that so far we've been using Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi router to um, basically uh, communicate between drones. It means that we are also limited by the range of that router. But how about direct communication from one drone to the next? That's uh, ongoing work, of course. And um, more importantly, we are working towards uh, looking into what is it that we can do with stronger collaboration. So imagine a stereo um, setup where instead of having a fixed baseline stereo, we have two cameras carried by two different drones, and then we can actively control the baseline, the distance between the two, such that we are able to have a better condition problem when we want to estimate the, the scene at different depths. Right, so um, basically with these three challenges that I described, we're trying to teach robots to see and collaborate because I believe that they are key in advancing robotic autonomy today. So um, you might think, so what is the application of all of this? So I think in this crowd, we're not going to have this problem. But usually when I talk about my work, the first thing that comes out is that people think uh, that this is all um, military applications. And I want to show people that there's so much more, but I'm sure you guys know already. So one can do digitization in archaeology, so monitor how uh, monuments are changing with earthquakes, with um, uh, rain. Uh, or, of course, search and rescue, inspecting a power plant for cracks or crop monitoring, like what Fenerob is doing. So computer vision and robotics have a lot to offer and can have a great impact. And I spend most of the talk this talking about drones. How can we realize this vision uh, using drones? But Frankly, the extension to other kind of platforms can be rather straightforward because the ideas are definitely transferable. And in some of these cases, we already have ongoing projects, for example, to um, basically to localize a train along the train tracks, um, also to have robots in construction, bigger robots in construction, actually we do work with an excavator like this, or have multiplayer games with your phone. So collaboratively, look at the space and start playing a game, a virtual game in the virtual world that the phones are mapping in real time. Or also with um, 
civil protection. So with the multiple drones, we're trying to um, estimate radiation readings um, by essentially having a, a radiation sensor on board each drone. And then all of these are collaborating with each other to come up with a radiation map of a potentially contaminated area. And with this, I would like to thank you and take any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Margarita, for the nice presentation. So we have time for questions.